Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to read just a few verses. The Bible says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken to the entire Roman world. Everyone went to his hometown to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who had been pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Kicking off a brand new Christmas series today, and we're calling it Making Room for Jesus. Making Room for Jesus. Because in our reading, Mary and Joseph, if you can get the picture and just kind of go with me to Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, they're coming into the city, and the city's busy, it's chaotic, and they're trying to find a hotel. And they go to one of the hotel managers and they said, I'm sorry, we're filled up. We have no room for you. I'm sure they probably went everywhere, everybody's house. Does anybody, can anybody host, host us? Can anybody make room for us? And finally, they resorted to a little manger out back. And, of course, you know the rest of the story. But I began to think about all that the innkeeper gave up when he failed to make room for Jesus, when he denied Mary and Joseph access into his hotel or into his inn. You know, you read the Christmas story and you see people showed up at the manger scene, some, the wise man, the wise men, kings, people of influence, gifts were brought Blessings financially, if you will. All of those things came into the place that made room for Jesus. But that hotel could have had all of that. But they missed out because they denied access to Mary and Joseph. We could, when we go to Israel, say we want to go to that hotel. It's a historic landmark. I mean, every president, like King David Hotel in Israel, every president has stayed there. It could be a big deal in the city of Bethlehem, a historic landmark 2,000 years later. However, we don't know where that hotel was or even if it was even stuck around much longer, if it's even there today. But we know about the manger scene because the manger made room when others denied access. What's my point? My point is when we fail to make room for Jesus, we lose much more than we get. But when we do make room for Jesus, we get much more than we lose. See, we have this almost thinking sometimes that if we make room for Jesus, if we go to church, if we serve, if we pay our tithes, if we worship, we're sacrificing, almost insinuating that we're giving something up. It's nothing compared to what you're going to get. And a lot of times, quite the opposite. We think if we don't go to church, if we don't serve, if we don't give of our finances, if we don't pray, if we don't read our Bible, it's almost like we're getting ahead and we're getting away with something. But really, you're losing out when you don't make room for Jesus. I thought about that innkeeper. We give him a hard time. We don't know who he is. We don't know uh, anything about him. I'm sure he was a good guy. But he had no idea who he was saying no to. Let's cut him some slack. He had no idea who Mary and Joseph was. This is just some out-of-town carpenter, out-of-town businessman. Yeah, his wife's pregnant. You know, I heard, you know, rumor gets around. I heard how she got pregnant. They claim the Holy Spirit did it. Right? I mean, they're already thinking, uh, they have no clue who they're turning away. Because they had no relationship. And a lot of times we say no to Jesus we don't literally say the words, but we get too busy. 
And we get too distracted and get caught up. And we can be good people. We just don't really know them. We just don't really have a relationship with them. We're saved. We're going to heaven. But we have no idea all the benefits that he brings with them. Verse 7 says something interesting. It says there was no room for them in the end. It doesn't say there was no room. It just says there was no room for them. Maybe there was room for the king. I'm sure they would have made room for the prince. I'm sure they would have made room for the who's who, the governor, some Mr. Big Shot influencer in the city. I'm sure if it was a friend or family member of the hotel owner or someone that in their mind could help them and do something for them, I'm sure they would have built on a room. It wasn't they didn't have room. They just didn't have room for Jesus. It's funny that we always have room for other things, but then when it comes to the things of God, we're out of room. Can I preach? Y'all look at me like that. It's going to be a long month. Isn't it interesting that we'll make time to go to every Christmas party, every function, every fellowship, every Christmas gathering, but we come to the house of God barely by the skin of our teeth if the preacher's lucky. It's amazing how we'll make room and we'll... Stand on our feet for hours, shopping malls and waiting in lines at the register. But if we're, if we're asked to stand in line more than about 15 or 20 minutes to get in church or to stand in line or to stand, to stand up in worship, we stood too long today. That wasn't supposed to be funny, but it's all right. I'll take it however I can get it. We'll work overtime, won't we, to make sure our kids get Christmas. I mean, we'll bust it. We'll, we'll do whatever we got to do. But then we get to the house of God and those same talents that you have to make money. All of a sudden, we have no more room to serve in the house of God. Now, you can use those talents to make money. But what about facilitating worship for somebody on a Sunday? You know, can I just say, and to be honest here, a TBH, a little disclosure here. Can, can, I, can I just say that um, I've met people like that before, and I'm not being judgmental. I just want to talk. I want to give you something to think about. I'm kind of easy going into your stuff here. I've, I've heard teachers say, Pastor, you don't understand. I'm with kids all week. Cut me a break. I'll do anything but serving kids' life. And that's cool. We don't make anybody do anything around here. But I start thinking, so you'll do it for money. But when it comes to the house of God, you won't do it for the kingdom. Isn't it amazing how we have so much room for other things, just not room for Jesus? Oh, man, we'll ring up our MasterCard, our American Express during Christmas. We'll do the 90 days same as cash for the sofa during Christmas. Man, we'll, fi we'll, finance, we'll finance a pizza if we have to for Christmas. Right? But then it comes to the things of God, and we have no more room in our budget, and we're good people. We love Jesus, but then we come to church. I'm not. Sweating and spitting and screaming and shouting, but I am so anointed right now. Isn't it interesting how we have room for other things? Just not Jesus. I, I, I thought about, Mom, I'm telling on myself, do you remember when we had to memorize Luke 2, the Christmas story? You remember, remember that? I, my teacher, I never could get past the end. I thought it said, and this was a, I was a third grader, cut me a break. I thought it said there was no room for them in the end, like at the end, E-N-D. 
And I always wondered why it said that. I was like, why would it say, you know, it says there's no room for him in the end, the hotel, the I-N-N, -N, end of the end. But there was no room for the, him in the end. I started thinking how that really applies to us in 2018. There's no room for him in the end because we wait to the end to try to make room for him. And I'm preaching. We, we stress and worry through our day because we don't pray first. And then we get to the end of our day and we have no more room for him in the end because we're so full of stress and worry and confusion and bitterness and anger and resentment and unforgiveness. And we're so full of that junk. We got room for this. We just don't have room for him. Why? Because we waited to the end. We, we wait to the end of our day or the end of our week. We don't put God first, and all week we're not filled with the things of God in our mind. And then we get to the weekend, and we wonder why it's a struggle to get my flesh up on a Sunday morning to go to church. I'm talking to you right now online. And, we, and we're struggling, and we think we're bad people. We must be sinners. We, can, we oversleep every Sunday morning. We'll get up at 5.30, go to work, and go work out and all that. But we can't go. You're not a sinner. You're not a bad person. You just can't all of a sudden make a mind shift, and you've been thinking one way all week, and then you get to the end, and you want to be spiritual. No, it's, it's the first fruits principle. Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first God's kingdom. And then all these other things at the end shall be added unto you as well. God wants you to have the other things. He just says, I know the key to getting the other things to you. And it's not when you seek the things, it's when you seek him first. I might have... I might have shared this before. If I did, forgive me. I told the first service, y'all only come once a month anyway. So there's about 70% of you that even if I did, you probably didn't see it. Um, but I thought about how we do a lot of times. That bowl represents our life. And I thought about how we fill our life with so many things that you're not going to build anything on. I love Popeye's fried chicken. There, I confessed. Yes, I have gained weight. That's why I'm wearing a jacket. It's cover-up time. When my mom goes home, I'll lose it again. The devil is a liar. My mom is an angel, but the devil is a liar. So I'll spend money on Popeyes. It ain't building nothing, but maybe my waistline. You know, nothing wrong with... Nothing wrong with college football. Pray for me. I, I stayed up. I, I can't sleep. I couldn't sleep last night. I was depressed. I texted a few people and said, can you preach for me? I'm a sinner. <laughs> Your preacher cussed last night during the Georgia game. I'm just confessing right now. <laughs> we had no business going for it. Fourth and 11 against Bam on the 50-yard line. Can I get a witness? Can't believe I just told people that I cussed. I'm sorry. Pray for me. Pray for me. I did. I did. I texted Trent Corey and I said, because me and him are diehard dog fans, and I said, Trent, can you preach for me tomorrow? Fly in. I said, I'm, I'm not worthy. I said, I got sin in my heart. Trent responded and said, dude, I backslidden too. I got, I'm just, so it made me feel better about myself. My mama's an Alabama fan. Try being nice to your mama. See, I can't even preach now. I'm so messed up. Oh, yeah. But the rumor is that Georgia will probably play Texas in the Sugar Bowl. I said, man, I got to go down to New Orleans. And I really contemplated until I saw what the tickets would be. I really contemplated. I'm going to go down there. Nothing wrong with going to the Sugar Bowl. Nothing wrong with going to a college football game, but not going to build anything on that. 
Hey, nothing wrong with getting kids Christmas gifts. Not going to build on it. No, no, nothing wrong with, uh, you know, nothing wrong with sports. I already made it very clear I'm a sports guy. Um, but my kids aren't going to miss church on Sundays for it. I ain't so holy. No, I'm not. I just cussed. I told you. <laughs> but it's the first things first principle. Nothing wrong with some of the things that we do. It's like Leanne, I've often quoted her, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a lot of things that are good things, just not God things. And some of these things may be wrong, by the way. You've got to work that out. <laughs> but but my, my bowl, my life, is kind of filled with stuff that I assure you, if you got the notice that you had three months to live, wouldn't matter. Then we try to be good little Christians and we come to church on Sunday and we want to put the rocks, the things of substance, the things that matter, we want to put them in. So we mean well and we put God's house in there. Bless God, he's me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I want to I want to be a tither. I want to trust God with my money. I want to serve in the house of God. Oh, wait a second. I'm trying. I mean well. I'm a good person. I'm just out of room. So therefore, the reason I'm out of room is not because I didn't have room. I just didn't have room for the right things. My life was full of a lot of things that really aren't going to matter. And we have this idea that if you're grinning, you're sinning, and if it's fun, it must be wrong, and the harder it is, the more spiritual it must be, and God's mad at me, and he does not want me to have these things, that's why I better put them in first, because I know he's not going to help me, and we have this idea that we serve a mean God. It's not that we have a mean God. God just said, I want to be first. And it's not because he's got an ego. It's because he said that's the only way this stuff is going to work in your life is if you put these things first. Now, if I put God's house first then I can enjoy my week. If I put God's, the tithe first, then I can enjoy the rest of my money. If I put God's house first, if I put God first, if I put reading his word first, then the Bible says I'll prosper in all my ways. If, if, I, if I'll pray first, I submit myself to God, I can resist the devil and he'll flee. But watch this, if I just try to resist the devil, he won't go anywhere. Because the key is submission first. I submit myself to God first. How many is this making sense for anybody in here? And if I'll put the things of God first before the trials come, before the storms come, now it looks like my life is full and I'm going to have a miserable life and my kids are going to grow up hating church and not wanting to be a Christian because all they had was spiritual things. That is not your God. Your God wants to give you the desires of your heart. But he said the key to that is seeking me first. And once I've put first things first, now I can fill the rest of my life up with all of the fun stuff. But I've put my God first. Now here's the principle. Here's the principle. The things that really matter, a lot of times you can't see them. 
Sometimes you're praising God and you don't see the results. Sometimes you're serving God and giving to the things of God and going to church on Sunday and being a worshiper and you're not being you're not seeing it right off, but I promise you if you'll continue to press in and continue to pray and continue to serve and continue to be faithful to God's house, it's the power of the continual. If you'll continue to put him first, then he said all of these other things shall be added up to you as well but we have to make room for him first so my little word for you today is a challenge it's not just a sermon it's a challenge are you putting him first I want to give you five ways very quickly I'm just going to read them then I'll expound on them the next few weeks I'm going to challenge you with five tangible ways to make room for Jesus these are five practical ways to make room for him. They all start with T, kind of help you remember them a little bit. Write them down. Number one is time. You don't spell love with a Benjamin Franklin. You don't spell love with an American Express card. You spell love, T-I-M-E. And if you love God and love your family, the greatest thing you can give is an investment of you. It's your time. So are you making room for him with your time? Number two, your talents. I said earlier, and I hope I didn't offend anybody, but I sure want to help you. And sometimes it takes offending and you getting over it and staying and knowing I'm right and you're wrong. Sometimes we have to make room for, with our talents and those things that we're gifted enough to make big money in may want to apply those things to the house of God and advance the kingdom with. So make room for him with your talents. There's people in here that can sing and play instruments and we don't even know it. There's people in here that can serve in kids' ministry and do other things and, and secure the security teams that we're putting in place and building. And you're a police officer or you're a you were a police officer or other things, and you're like, I don't want nothing to do with that. I get it. I understand it can be hard jobs at times. And whatever that is for you is what I'm trying to say. You're good at spreadsheets and, and, and projects and putting organization and whatever it may be. I'm not talking about just Christmas season. I'm talking about in life. When you begin to apply your talents to the house of God, it's amazing how your paycheck grows. Number, number three I'm asking you this Christmas season to make room for him in your treasure. In your treasure. You show me your bank statement, and I'll tell you who your God is. It's just that simple. Don't get mad at me. It's just that simple. I don't even have to ask you if Jesus is first. Show me your money. Number four, the trials of life. We make room for worry. We make room for stress. We make room for a counselor. Make room for Jesus. Give it to Jesus. Watch what Jesus can do with it when you make room for him. And number five, your testimonies. God is going to do some great things in your life during this Christmas season. I believe it. I'm telling you, for the people that will make room for him. But when he does... Can you connect the dots? Are you going to keep it to yourself? Or are you going to tell others? Brag on Jesus. You know, I used to be like, well, I don't want to brag. I don't want people to think that I'm. And then I realized, well, I didn't do it. How would I be bragging on me? Jesus likes to be bragged about. Revelations 12, 11 says they overcame the enemy by the blood of the lamb. That was half of it. And the word of their testimony. You want to be an overcomer in life? Start sharing your testimony. I read that testimony earlier. Start emailing me some testimonies. And let's get it out. Facebook, you start posting some testimony. And I'm not brag session. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about genuine from your heart. This is what God has done. I want to encourage somebody on social media. You never know who could be helped through a testimony. So over the next few weeks, I want to make room for Jesus in our time, in our talents, in our treasure, in our trials. Because how many know there are trials? Let's just confess. And then our testimonies. 
There's a couple, I want to show this video to you in closing. There's a couple that did just that. They went through a major trial. They have a great testimony, and they went public with it. And I hope it encourages you, and I want you to apply whatever they're going through to whatever you're going through. If God did it for them, he can do it for you. He's not a respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of principle. When you make room for him, he'll make room for you. Let's show the video. This past January, Sydney was preparing for her boards. She just finished grad school. She wanted to be a midwife. She wanted to serve women. She wanted to serve children. And she'd been having heart trouble for the past year, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. The doctor said, like, hey, let's just roll it out. Her doctor ordered an ultrasound. He says you have to be here at 430 and don't come by yourself. He brought me in his office and sat me down and he looked at me in the face and he got in front of me and he held my hands. He said, we think you have cancer. We don't know exactly what kind of cancer it is. Luckily, your left kidney looks wonderful, but this right kidney absolutely has to go. At that point then he said, and it's also in your lungs. And I was like, oh my gosh, I bet it's everywhere. You're imagining how bad it can be. I, I just kept kept asking like, hey, well, well, what are the odds of them saving, saving the kidney? He finally said, Lou, he's like, Lou, there, there's no, I don't see any way that we're gonna save that kidney. You're reaching out for any bit of hope uh, that man can provide, that science, that medicine. You could see it, the fear on her face. And the first thing she said was, what are we gonna do? And I told her, I said, we're gonna bury our face in the father's chest and we're gonna hold on as tight as we can and we're not gonna look anywhere else. As much as I have faith, I'm the one with 10 years of medical education and you shoot guns for a living and you just don't understand I'm going to die. And we drove to UAB and that was the longest four hour drive that I can remember and I kissed my kids goodbye, not knowing what or if I was going to see them again. So the doctors came in. He explained to me that the tumor was so large, it was bigger than the size of a football in my belly. We did confirm it is this type of cancer. We want answers, but right now we're just going to praise. The answers will come eventually and uh, she all but collapsed and hit her knees and just kept singing and singing and singing and singing. She started telling them, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be a tragedy. I'm going to be a testimony. You're going to write papers about me because my God is bigger than this. And we prayed like we've never prayed before. And I had hands laid on me and I was anointed with oil. And I asked for forgiveness of my sins. She said, you know, I can't offer you any hope. And uh, she held up her hand, she said, this is how much hope I can offer you because we've never done this before. But I have to believe that God has a plan for you because your kidney was destroyed and we're doing a clinical trial. And in order to be in that trial, you have to have two good kidneys. And I don't know how you have two good kidneys because we have an ultrasound and two CTs that say your kidney was destroyed. But you sit in front of me today with two good kidneys. I was like, okay, God, there you are. And so now we're in this place, you know, sitting here a month away from celebrating the birth of the greatest gift anyone could ever have. And I sit in front of you with a stage four incurable cancer still in my lungs like a broken record, you know. It was cry, pray, praise, repeat. Nobody can make us any promises. And the only promises you have to hold on to at that point is what we claim to believe, you know, that is in Christ, you know, the hope that is in Christ. I can't pass up the chance to invest in hope. Stand on your feet all over this room. Did you hear what he said? The last thing he said, I have to invest in hope. When's the last time you've invested in hope? I don't know what your need is. I don't know what you're going through, but I know you can praise your way out of anything. 
I'm telling you, you can praise your way out of anything. Why do, it's, that's make-believe, and that's just faking it, and that's just goofy spiritual stuff. This is real life out here, preacher. I get it. I get it. But in your worship, and I told you about the telescope, your worship starts building your faith. Your tears don't move God. He's moved to compassion by your tears. But he's only moved to action by your faith. And when you begin to have real issues outside of these four walls and real things you're worried about right now, and you begin to lift up your voice and you begin to sing about the name of Jesus and you worship him, the things don't change. But your faith gets bigger. And if I put 200 pounds on the bar tomorrow when I'm working out, it's the same 200 pounds, but six months down the road, if I've gotten used to growing me and getting me stronger, that 200 pounds is the same 200 pounds, but it's so much lighter now. And God says, come to me, all you are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I know how to lighten the load, and it comes through worship. It comes through making room. For Jesus, come on all over this building. If you have a need, lift your hand. All over this building, if you have something you need God to do. If it's big enough, begin to lift the other hand as a universal act of surrender. And let's begin to worship Jesus.